Hey, this is Joe. This is Wayne. Tiny picture of my cat. And Wayne's going to sit over here. I'll tell you about what Wayne's sitting on at the end of the video. In this video, I want to answer a couple of questions from the comments. Here's the first one from Bribey Bribey Music. Hello, quick question. If I incorporate a mic pre, do I turn on the phantom power on the preamp and the interface? Or if only one or the other, which one? It's a good question. So phantom power is this pretty nifty way to power up condenser microphones that need a little electricity to actually run. You push the button on whatever it's plugged into and that sends the electricity down the line into the microphone. It's pretty amazing. I, I don't know how it works, but it's cool. The general rule is whatever this is plugged into is what supplies the phantom power. So if it's going into an external preamp and then into an interface, you turn on the phantom power on the external preamp and not the interface. Cool. It reminds me of a story. When, when I was in college, we had access to these really nice Coles ribbon microphones. If you've seen them, they kind of look like hockey pucks. And they told us like very strongly, these are expensive, these are fragile, these are ribbon microphones. If you put phantom power to them, they will explode. At least that's the, the message I received. I don't know if that's what they said. Um, so we were doing a drum tracking session and had the ribbon mics as, I believe, overheads. And then we had a four-hour session in Studio B. Then we had to move across the hall to Studio A for another four-hour session that started at, like, midnight because crazy college people and their metabolism. Anyway, um, so we unplug everything. We move everything over to the other studio to continue tracking, which is a terrible way to work. But anyway, we get in the studio, and we're setting up and getting all our routing for the second session, the second four-hour session. And I noticed that the thing that those ribbon mics are plugged into, the phantom power button is pushed on. And my heart sank. I thought, I've just ruined, this will bankrupt me. I'm a poor college kid and I just ruined some really expensive microphones. I don't even know how much they're worth. Um, turns out they were fine. So I think technically that can ruin a ribbon microphone if certain factors are in play, like if it's not quite wired correctly. But dodged a bullet there. Whew, I'm glad that didn't happen. All right, let's move on to the next one. Roy says, I'm wondering about how you go about writing songs. I mean, literally writing them. Um, I don't write music notation, but I do guitar tab. How would you pair that with lyrics on a notepad, et cetera, et cetera? So good question. Um, there's so many ways to do it, so there's really no right or wrong way, but you asked me how I do it. In a recent video, I showed you my purple notebook from when I did that dumb 50 songs in 12 weeks challenge. Um, the way I did that was I just wrote, I would sit down and come up with a musical part. Okay, that's cool. Let's make that a verse, figure out the music, and then I would write lyrics for the verse. And so I'd literally just write lyrics on the page and then just jot some chords over the top. Um, then I would write music that would work for a chorus. Then I would write lyrics for the chorus. Then if it needs a bridge, I'd make that decision. And if it did, I'd write the music for the bridge. Then I'd write the lyrics for the bridge. And then I'd go back and write verse two. Usually I'd go, I'd write verse one, chorus, write a verse two, and then figure out a bridge. That's typically the order that I would go in uh, and still do to this day. The end result would be scribbled lyrics on a page with some chords written out. And then I would record everything on a voice memo on my phone so I don't forget how it goes because you're going to forget. Um, so that, that would be my process. Now, that's enough for me to say I have put my stamp on it. I've written a song. Now, if I were to bring in musicians or if I was about to start actually producing that song, that's another story. That's when I'd start to I'd separate lyrics and chords out. I would do lyrics on a sheet by itself, and I would do chords as like a Nashville number chart. So we're talking like, I've done videos on this, one, one, four, one, that kind of thing. Um, I, I, don't f I don't feel like you need to, I think guitar tabs are cool for learning like how to play solos and stuff. Um, I would, I've never written in guitar tabs, and I don't see any need to do that. Um, typically, for most songs and sessions I've played on, and I've played on hundreds around Nashville and here in the studio, you're, you're talking about chords. We're playing these chords in this order at this tempo. That's all we need for a song. And of course, lyrics and stuff too. But from a music standpoint, from a musician instrumentalist standpoint, that's all I really need. Robert Barton fires off a doozy. Says, how do professionals get their mixes to sound good on all formats? Is it as simple as a really good mix will automatically sound good in the car, etc.? This is a great question. This is a very common question, and it's something we all have to deal with, right? We've all had that moment, and if you haven't, you will, where it sounds amazing here, then you take it there, and it sounds terrible. Um, I did a song years and years ago, early on when I was learning how to record and mix. I did this acapella song. It's this beautiful, like, seven-part harmony. I recorded, like, 14 tracks of vocals. Um, just this beautiful arrangement of this song. It was Ave Maria by Franz Bibel, if you're familiar with that. Um, 
really beautiful song. So I had my vocals and I had a bunch of reverb and it, that was it. Was really proud of it and I went home for Christmas and my, my wife and I at her parents' house and I said, I want to play you the song I made because I was really proud of it. So I plug, I get the CD and I put it into their home theater system. And as soon as it goes, the first line goes, there's a bass line that goes, this is big, huge, low end to it. Now me, since I'm not really a bass, I'm probably at most a tenor baritone. Um, I can hit the note, but it doesn't have a lot of fullness to it, unlike my dad who can hit those notes and shake the room, which is amazing. But I am not him. However, I did have, I was using Logic at the time, and I had this there was this plugin called a subharmonic generator that took a note and then generated harmonics below the note rather than above. Very cool. So what it ended up making making me sound like is this the best bass singer of all time. So it would go da na na da, and it would just resonate huge and big and amazing and beefy and awesome. Like my chest hair would just grow as soon as I listened to it. Um, all well and good, except my father in law had a sound system with a subwoofer. <laughs> so as soon as I play it, the first, no, 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 the fourth note, I immediately like crumble into myself because it's all nice. Dum, dum, dum. <laughs> the whole room shakes. Why? Because there was a crap load of information at like 50 hertz and below that I didn't even know was there because I'd mixed on pretty small speakers and little headphones and I hadn't really checked my mix anywhere. Um, and I just thought it was going to be great. And it was completely like unlistenable in a system that could actually reproduce the low frequencies. There's no reason ever that an acapella piece needs to have stuff from 20 to 50 Hertz. And I had lots of stuff. Granted, none of my, none of them are musicians except for my brother-in-law, Joel. So I don't think he was in the room. So they were just like, oh, it's so beautiful, it's so nice. I, they, didn't, they didn't even notice. Um, but I noticed, and I still remember it, and it still keeps me awake at night. That's not true. It doesn't keep me awake at night. But the, prop, the, the thing here is, if I can give you one piece of advice when it comes to this, it is this. When we get into making music in a home studio, we fall into this trap of only listening to our music in our home studio, and we lose all perspective as to what a good mix sounds like. So I might listen to... Spotify in my car all day, every day, and I listen only to Joe Gilder music, that's me, in this room. Do you see the disconnect here? I only listen to good mixes over there, and I listen to my mixes here. There's no way to know if mine are close to those. There's no way to compare. It's apples to oranges. The, the solution is to get familiar with what good mixes sound like in here. Then you'll flip over to your mix and say, oh, mine doesn't sound like that. Then you can make some changes. There's a lot more to it, but it really is. Mixing is more about developing your ears and your listening than anything else. You can learn all the compression and EQ techniques in the world. You can learn every single trick there is in the book and still get bad mixes if, you're not, if you don't develop your listening system. That's something I talk about in both my mixing and mastering courses. Um, you can check those out if you're interested, if you want me to train you in how to listen and then make those decisions, I can do that. It's really fun. Go to homestudiocorner.com slash mix or slash master, depending on which one you want to learn. And final question from Ringo. Speaking of my mastering course, can someone master mastering effectively without doing classes? Absolutely. You are more than free to take the slow approach. <laughs> to learning this stuff. I don't mean that snark. Well, I do mean it kind of snarky, but my point is think about storytelling. If you were to take uh, like Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, The Martian, three greatest stories of all time. Just kidding, but they're good. They're good stories. You could plug in. There's a certain formula that all good stories follow for the most part. And one of the key components of those stories is a trusted guide. So Yoda, He's not the star of the show, Luke is, but Yoda is the trusted guide. Gandalf is the trusted guide for Frodo. Um, in The Martian, it's probably science that's his guide because he can't talk to anybody. Um, but that, the general thing is the guide helps the hero achieve whatever the objective is. Overcome adversity, achieve some great thing. Think about professional athletes, uh, especially like professional golfers, professional swimmers. They're good enough to figure this stuff out on their own, what do they do? They all hire coaches, right? They all have coaches. The coaches can't perform as well as the person, but the coach is still valuable to the person because they have a history of coaching people and helping them get the most out of themselves. And then think about the old apprenticeship thing, right? If I wanted to be a blacksmith, the best way to learn being a blacksmith wasn't to go 
buy a hammer and one of those bellows things, build a fire and just start figuring it out on my own. I suppose you could, someone did, right? Over centuries, people figured out how to hammer stuff into shapes. But generally speaking, civilization as a whole improves because we build on the ideas of the last generation or someone who's gone before us. So when it comes to doing something like this, it just seems to make sense. If you want to learn how to do it, learn from someone who's done it because it'll save you a lot of time and frustration. You don't have to start from scratch. I was listening to a talk the other day and was talking about this idea of in business or even in like, even in music, we never actually start from scratch. Like I love a blank piece of paper. I love the, 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 like the, the possibility of an empty sheet of paper, but anything that I build on that sheet of paper is really going to be I'm not really creating something from nothing. I'm assembling from resources that I've gathered, right? Uh, if I'm going to write a song, I'm not creating an all new chord. They've all been created already. And I'm not over here trying to come up with new chords. I want to take the chords that already exist and the notes that already exist and work them into a new piece of music. That's what this is. So in the same way, if you want to learn how to do something, whether it's wood carving or mastering a song, it makes sense to learn from someone else. And you can certainly do that here on YouTube if you want to dive in deeper with me and get my best advice on how to do this stuff. That's why those courses exist. So they are there waiting for you. If you want a bit of a shortcut to get to where you want to be, they'll be able to help you. Again, those links are homestudiocorner.com slash and then either mix or master. You can check those out. See if they're right for you. Come try them out. I do have a guarantee on them. I did not mean for this to become a commercial, but it just made sense based on the questions that we got. Um, by the way, Wayne, back to cute little Wayne. He is sitting on a binder that is filled with pages. These pages are from the Home Studio Corner newsletter. Not many people know about this yet. I've been keeping it a secret. Only a handful of people know. But I've actually launched a print newsletter called the Home Studio Corner Newsletter. Brilliant title. Um, it looks a little bit like this. That was the first issue. We're a few issues in now. Um, and this is, I guess, me telling you about it. So it's a part of a new level of my VIP membership. Wayne, can you stay right there? Okay, thank you. Um, called the Gold Membership. And one of the, th of the many things you get when you sign up is that sucker mailed to you once a month, anywhere in the world, by the way. I've got uh, this just today. I was thinking I've got somebody in Denmark, a couple of folks in Australia, a couple of folks in Germany, one or two in the UK, and some in the United States of America. Can you believe that? Anyway, if that's the kind of thing that gets you excited, go check it out, homestudiocorner.com slash gold. And this week, actually, there's a special thing at that page. So the week this video is coming out, I'm actually... Um, giving away something for those who join gold this week. So uh, I'm not going to say what that is. You'll have to just go to the link to find out. Otherwise, thanks for watching. Say bye to Wayne. He appreciates you, as do I. See ya.